I appreciate the banisters that are up here. I guess Brother Buddy did that. Is that correct? Well, that's what I mean. <laughs> I was thinking of uh, throw out the lifeline. Well, that's sort of a lifeline. For those of us who mount this pulpit from time to time, then those stairs aren't the, or steps, I guess I should say, aren't the greatest thing in the world as far as having much room to place your foot. Throw out the lifeline. If you look in Genesis 19, they we're not going to spend much time there except to refer to it, we have the record that Moses gives us of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah because of their vile wickedness that they'd engaged in a long time and the escape of Lot and some of his family from that place. We find that inspiration writing the New Testament made reference to that in Genesis chapter, or rather Jude rather, Jude verse 5, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though once you knew this, how that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels which kept not their first estate and left their own habitation, <clears throat> he hath reserved an everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. Then verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And then he makes application to people who need it then, as the church need to be warned about it. Likewise, also, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. But as you come to the end of this brief epistle, you find in verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God. Now, just let that sink in for a moment. That is a personal responsibility every Christian has. Keep yourselves in the love of God. That's something you must do. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now watch further. And of some have compassion, making a difference. You see judgment involved in the light of the truth as people live by it. They evaluate others. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Have you ever heard of fire and brimstone preaching? Well, I think we have, and a lot of it is described as something hilarious or backward or a bunch of nuts yelling and hollering, and sometimes that's what happens. Not much substance, or as used to be said, not much lightning, but a lot of thunder. And it's the lightning that kills. But notice you have here that they are to be pulled out of the fire. This is the letter written to Christians saying we have a responsibility to keep ourselves in the love of God. That means to remain faithful. Yes, my brethren help me to be faithful, but they can't do what is my personal responsibility. Nobody can study the Bible for me. Nobody can pray for me. Nobody can yield their bodies a living sacrifice, which is our reasonable service, for me. That's said to each one of us. When we read that, we know the Lord's saying, this means you. 
That's part of your responsibility. And so on you can go as you study the scriptures. So when we speak of fire and brimstone preaching, you see there is a fire. And Christians in their work of preaching the gospel, which is God's power to save, Romans 1.16, we're offering them the way, the only way of salvation. So what I mean by the expression, a fire and brimstone sermon, is a sermon or sermons that strongly urges sinners to repent of sins under the terrible, horrible threat of losing, losing one's soul eternally in a fiery hell of outer darkness with the devil and his angels and all wicked people of all time populating it and no good thing at all, no hope, no expectation of repentance doesn't exist. It's a place of intense punishment for those who use this life not caring for God. I think sometimes when I hear people in their foul mouths and, and as a man speaketh in his heart or as a man speaketh in his heart so easy from his heart and I hear somebody tell somebody else to go to hell do they realize what they're saying no no one would want anyone to go to hell as Christians who have heard and believed the gospel and obeyed it from the heart, having the Lord add us to the church, we know the importance of being faithful as the New Testament describes it, and we know that we want to save others. And that song, though I didn't know he was going to save it, sing it, throughout the lifeline, is a fitting thing that the church is charged to do and by our individual influence and in living the Christian life and by the outright teaching in every way that's wholesome and good we're seeking to throw out a lifeline the lifeline of truth the truth shall make you free and striving to pull people out of the fire for it awaits there is then a scriptural fire in brimstone sermon the brimstone being sulfur, and that's why you read of what was rained down by God upon Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain. That's why that's used by inspiration to represent the eternal damnation of a person lost in sin. These things already ought to remind us of why our lives in the flesh ought to be yielded to God always that the kingdom of God ought to come first in every thought, word, and action, that our every bit of work we do is for the spread of the kingdom and the strengthening of the same thing. Only citizens of the kingdom of heaven who are faithful to the cross of Christ will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. The rest will hear, depart from me, ye that work iniquity in the everlasting fires prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, we've got Halloween coming up at the end of the month. There will be all sorts of ghouls and goblins and whatever and all kinds of dressing this way and what and so forth and everybody laughing about it and who can scare somebody else and whatever. I guess that serves and things like that to mask a real, genuine, horrible reality That's just one heartbeat away for most people. Complete, radical change. In circumstances, situations, and place, and environment. All dependent on how we live our lives here or how we don't. So in this sermon, I intend to discuss the use of of eternal fiery punishment and God's terrible threats that he gives hopefully to motivate sinful people to change their sinful thinking and behavior. I've already cited to you where the fire and brimstone comes from. I mentioned what some people think is fire and brimstone 
preaching, not much substance, and a lot of yelling and telling horror stories and so forth. You know, the, the, you can't get any more of a horror story than when you read what the Bible plainly says about the final of the wicked. Now, I know when we read in Luke 16 to the rich man and Lazarus, if that's talking about the place of departed spirits. The end of the world has not yet come. Resurrection hasn't taken place. The judgment hasn't taken place. But nevertheless, here is a rich man. Got the best there is to offer in that day and time. One minute there he is as far as what this world has to offer. Lavishly clothed and having what he wants to eat. Split second. He's awakened to torment in the flames of fire. And Lazarus, who had nothing of this world and was miserable, is now in a place of comfort. The roles are completely reversed. And I think about how many people will die during the time it takes me to preach this sermon. And they will step into a place for which they are totally unprepared. Like the rich man. And the rich man died. And in Hades, he lifted up his eyes in torment. And he says, I'm tormented in this flame. Send Lazarus over. That he may dip the tip of his finger in water and touch it to my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Yes, there's real fire and brimstone teaching that's given to cause men to see how am I living my life, no matter how young you are, no matter how old you are, male or female, rich or poor, this life will terminate. But you won't terminate. You will continue on just like the rich man and Lazarus. God declares, get that part, please. Not me or any other man, that he will cast unrepentant sinners into the fires of hell. Thus, we labor to bring the sinner to repentance before the great day of God's wrath arrives. Now, God has used threats. We may not realize that, but he has used threats all through the Bible to say, if you don't live like I teach you, here's what's going to happen to you. Loving parents threaten their kids by saying, if you do that, or if you don't do that. Sometimes I hear child psychologists say, don't threaten. Well, my Heavenly Father, who loves me better than anybody can ever understand, threatens. He always uses the fear of punishment in his efforts to get men to live righteous lives. In the beginning, it started with God and Adam and Eve concerning the forbidden fruit. In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. I think we ought to follow his love. Am I as concerned about myself, my family, my brethren in the church, and those that need the gospel, alien sinners, that I will speak as clearly as my God did? And John says, God is love. And that's a severe threat, if there ever was one. And the day you eat of this, you will die. And I doubt they understood exactly what death meant, but they're going to experience it. And when they did, immediately spiritually, they were separated from God, and physically they began to die. And this world has never been the same since then. And because the sin impacted this world as it did, God destroyed this world by a great flood, changed the whole course of events in nature, so that this world today is not as it was before the flood. All of that because of the heinousness of sin. Oh, if we could see sin as God sees it. What a difference it would make. 
throughout the scriptures, God continued to warn, plainly warn of terrible consequences to the disobedient. In Deuteronomy, the restatement of the law, chapter 11, 26 through 28, Moses, of course, is talking about things as it would relate to the children of Israel before he goes up to Mount Nebo and dies. Joshua takes over and they enter into the land of Canaan. Moses says this, Behold, I set before you a day, uh, this day a blessing and a curse. Now think about that for a minute. That's what's set before us too. Right to this day, God has set before us a blessing and a curse. He says, a blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command this day. And a curse, if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day, to go after other gods which you have not known. The principle is the same. And the question we ought to ask is, though we do not have the pantheon of gods that they had then in uh, that part of the world, whatever is more important to you, for you to give your time and money and so forth to, that's your God if it's more than what you give to the Lord. Satan is telling us regularly, every way it can possibly come, from the government, education, churches themselves, various religions, you shall not die. There really is no hell of fire and brimstone. God's just too loving and gracious to send any of his children or anybody else to such a place. Or as I say, they just say there is no such place. Or you do like certain religions that says, well, the people who are wicked, they die and just go out of existence, and only those that live right will be brought back into existence. If you're Jehovah's Witnesses, so-called, then you believe a little 144,000 will be in heaven with Jesus ruling, and the earth will turn back into a Garden of Eden, and you'll live on it like Adam and Eve did before they sinned. But all of those who did not live as they think God says, Jehovah says, they just go out of existence. So there is no eternal punishment. You just go out of existence. Various others have all sorts of ways of doing away with the fire and brimstone of a hell that is eternal and reserved for those who die outside of Christ are unfaithful to him. I can't think of much more today that people would rather hear than that. If you try to talk to people, there's not enough knowledge of the Bible for them to even have any inclination about what you're talking about. And certainly if you speak of hell, except as a cuss word, then they're not going to understand anything about it. If you talk about eternal torment after this life is over, you're not going to. I suggest to you, you have access on computers, on the Internet, to go to these various funeral homes and look at the obituaries. That's kind of interesting. To keep up with things back up at home, I go to a Proctor funeral home quite often. I have other ways, too, to find out about people my age or others I knew or had connections with that have died. And that seems to be more frequent lately. I don't know why that. But I read these obituaries, and I have yet to find one. Well, he had every opportunity to love God and keep his commandments, but he chose not to, and we're sorry. But he's in hell now. You won't find anything like that, even intimating such a thing. Some way or the other, they always get him in heaven. And that's what the world wants to hear. That's the reason fire and brimstone sermons are made light of, or at least one great reason. But what did Jude say? Pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. People must know that God, unlike many parents, 
But God never threatens in vain. Never. If parents are going to use threats properly to unruly children and care through with them. I remember one time we were in a place and an elder came in to church and he said, I was in the grocery store this week and I was on an aisle and a mother had a child in the basket and just pitching a fit, grabbing everything off of the shelves and screaming and the mother was saying, I I'm going to deal with you or I'm going to say this. I'm going to do that. Threatening. Never happened. They stayed sort of in the same aisle. And he said, I just had all of it I could take. He said, I went up to her when I got closer and said, why don't you give him just exactly what he wants and needs? And she said, what? That he's been asking for you to discipline him and you won't do it. How do you ever expect him to learn anything? Well, that's where we are. We threaten and threaten and threaten and never follow through. God is not like that. Oh, but he hasn't, he hasn't done it yet. Please remember that God is not a man. Time means absolutely nothing to God. As he said, the day is with the Lord as a thousand years and thousand years is a day. So God in eternity, not governed by time, says something will be. It will be. What is it time to him? Whether it happens today or... 500 years from now, he knows the end from the beginning, and every second in between, every sparrow that dies, he knows it, and the very hairs of your head are numbered. He's omniscient. He knows exactly when to bring this world to an end and exactly when to exact punishment. But he never threatens in vain. And when he says there is a fire into which he will cast all wicked people and the church has a responsibility to snatch them out of that fire, we better get busy. It's a repent or else. That is the continual watchword of God throughout the Bible. Luke 13, 1 through 5, Jesus declared, Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Except means if and only if you repent, you'll perish. When you read the seven churches of Asia, repent is what Jesus said to various ones of them. And he says, if you don't, I will remove your candlestick. That is, you cease to be any worth to me. He also warned false teachers in the church. He said of some in that day, Behold, concerning those who taught some way justify adultery and fornication, that that's all right. I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. God will punish us severely, more than our minds can grasp, even when we read these words about hellfire. If we fail to believe in Him, obey his gospel, be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, and live a godly life in the church. Now, I'm sure that we have seen the slogan somewhere, possibly on a bumper sticker, no fear. Well, I see people today, and it doesn't seem to me they fear much of anything. Sometimes uh, men fear their wives, but even sometimes then, I don't know, that's supposed to be a little bit of a joke. But I don't know whether he gets it or not. Did you hear that, Ken, or I need to repeat it? Repeat it? No. You have to get the tape. There's one person. <laughs> there is one person. One kind of person. An unrepentant sinner. Who needs to understand what fear is. And be full of it. Hebrews 10 verse 31. It is a fearful thing. To fall into the hands of the living God. That was written to Christians. It wasn't written to people out in the world. It was written to members of the Lord's church. Who heard the same gospel we've heard and obeyed it. But they were not living like the New Testament said. Now, who spoke the most about hell, the final abode of the wicked, in Greek, the Gehenna hell? 
Who did it? Jesus. May come as a surprise to some people. I've said it before from this pulpit, but Jesus did. And he did more than he spoke of heaven. Why would he do that? He's the great physician. He's the one who gave his life for us because of his love for us. The Greek word Gehenna, I said, is translated hell. Now, in the King James Version, you'll find Hades translated hell too. But they're two different words. There's also Tartarus, but we won't get into that. Nevertheless, if you're going to have word studies, you ought to study those. But when it comes to the eternal boat of the wicked following the resurrection and the judgment, that's Gehenna. That is hell. And Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, and fear not them which can kill the body, but not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Now my loving Savior, who gave his life for me, said that. You think I ought to follow it? You think I ought to cultivate it? I ought to believe it? Teach it to others? Warn people about what they ought to be doing with the time they're here on earth. Mark 9, 43 through 44, the fire is described, the fires of hell, as unquenchable. Sometimes we see out west these fires, they have such a terrible time of quenching them, putting them out. You can't put out the fires of hell. They're a fire like no man's ever seen on this earth. Mark 9, 43 through 44. Hell is also described as that place where their worm dieth not. I think it's an allusion to maggots. I said some time ago that most of what's said in the New Testament about the resurrected body pertains to the resurrection of the faithful dead and a glorified body like Christ. We don't have much said about the body that the unfaithful or alien sinner will have when he's raised. It just says... The resurrection of damnation. It can't be a body like the saints would have. It is a corruptible body. Can you imagine being in a corruptible body and never getting out? In 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, Paul wrote this to Christians and to you who are troubled. You who are suffering persecution because you preach and live the gospel. There is a rest. You, you rest with us. There is a rest. Let this be on your mind. Let it give you peace. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Nothing pertaining to God will be found in hell. He's not present. He has nothing to do with it. People did not want to have God in their lives on earth. People didn't want to believe in Jesus. People didn't want to live as the New Testament teaches. People opposed it. God says, all right, here's the place prepared for people like you. And we often say heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. So is hell. And right now, we're preparing for one place or the other. Hebrews 12, 29 says our God is a consuming fire. Again, written to Christians who weren't doing what they ought to do. Wailing and gnashing, the gritting of teeth is always indicative of terrible agony and pain, Matthew 13, 42 and 50. There's eternal weeping, eternal grinding and gritting of their teeth. It's not just for a second or a minute or an hour. There is no time to measure things. You're there. There is no hope, though your mind now says, well, out there in the future I'll get out. No, you will not. Nobody will. You'll never get out. There is no ending. It's eternal. Outer darkness is mentioned in Matthew 8, 12. 
perpetual, terrifying blackness like we've never known, Jude 13. Somebody says, how can you have a flame and be tormented in it and have blackness? You know, minds that ask a question like that remind me of the fellow one time who Jehovah's Witness, we'd had a study in one of their own buildings. And we were talking about the elements melting with fervent heat and the earth also and the works that they're in being burned up. And he did like this. He said, have you ever taken dirt and tried to burn it? How do you answer such imbecility? I said, I've never tried to speak it into existence out of nothing either. But God did. And He can create then a place where the flame is more than any fire we've ever seen and in a blackness that's blacker than any darkness we've ever seen. Jude 13 reads, Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars. Listen, to whom is reserved the blackness and darkness forever. Forever. You die lost. That's it. That's what it means to be lost. We use that word. We don't understand. To die lost, that means that's where you're headed. And you're not coming out. The place of torment is prepared ultimately for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 41. What kind of place must that be? The devil hates us with a hate that we can't comprehend. He was a murderer from the beginning. He's a father of lies, and that's where we want to be. Everything going on in this world that's wicked right now is because of Satan. Everything in Afghanistan, everything, he didn't make it either. The World War II, World War I, all the starvation, it's all because of Satan. And you want to book a room in his hotel forever? And that's what's going to happen if you don't choose God. If you don't love Him with all that you are and have, love your neighbors yourself, love the truth, and use what time you've got on this earth in service to Him. To develop a love for Him because of His love for you. So what kind of a place hell must be to be doomed in the true sense of doom with all wicked people forever plus the devil and those wicked spirits? Well, we should even dread to think of it. In Matthew 25, 46, there's the mentioning of everlasting punishment. The idea in punishment is pain. Have you ever been in intense pain? Some of us have. Some more than others. Intense pain. Today, tomorrow, the next day, never ending. There is no night. There is no rest intense pain for I am tormented in this flame you know when you think about that our Lord gave that as a real happening about 2,000 years ago now we measure time of course and 2,000 years is a long period the rich man is still tormented in that flame and he never has got that little bit of water that would cover the tip of a finger to touch it to his tongue. He's still there. He will be tomorrow. He will be on and on. Heaven is forever. So is hell. Because they're both described as forever and eternal. So it's a wonderful thing to think about being in heaven. That'll never end. The quality of life, so it's called life, eternal life. There is no life in hell. There is existence, but it's called eternal death. Because it's separation from God completely, totally, and absolutely. In Revelation 21, 8, but the fearful... Some of my brethren need to understand this about standing up for what's right when it puts you on the spot. God, notice who he puts the fearful in line with. Unbelieving, abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. 
Did he mean it? Does he mean it? Will it happen? As surely as you're looking at me and I'm looking at you. Revelation 20, 15, And whosoever was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Maybe the most dreaded thought, if we're lost, will be the hopeless moment when we realize in that place of black darkness, fiery burning and agonizing, searing pain, that we're never getting out of that place. All hope is gone. We are by nature hopeful creatures. We can survive even if there's just a glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel. There is no light at the end of the tunnel because there is no end of the tunnel. There's not a million years. I suppose a person could say if I'm going to be in hell a million years, then I still can get by to the end. I'll be out then. No, the, no nobody who's cast into hell will ever get out. That's what eternity means. That's what forever means. And in this state of probation, now in the flesh, we're having an opportunity to say, Lord, I want to go to hell or I want to go to heaven. Yes, God severely and radically threatens us with a punishment so awful and eternal that no honest, sane person in his right mind would for one split second play with the idea of being in hell. And the reason for that is, is that once condemned to that place, there's no escape. It's forever and ever and ever. And then we can't even get some Christians or simple saints to worship God regularly. I close with this. When God loved us, He gave His Son who loved us took upon himself human form, became a human as you are and I am. Was tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. Thus as the Lamb of God lovingly he went to the cross and bore our sins on that tree, suffering, bleeding, and dying. Death could not hold him for he had no sin. Thus he broke the bars of death and came forth. Now, if I were to give one of my children to save some people who could not save themselves and they were in the mess they're in because they chose to be there. And by me giving my son and him willing to go or any one of my children and do what was necessary to save them even while they were yet sinners in rebellion to God. And they spurned him rejected his gospel, made light of him, blasphemed him. On the day of judgment, how would I deal with them? It would call forth the most exacting, vengeful justice that I could give. And what I could give would be nothing to what God can give. Vengeance is mine, he said. I will repay, saith the Lord. And we've been reading some in this fire and brimstone sermon. From the plain language of his word, the threats he has made to motivate us because he loves us to repent of our sins and obey the truth. Why will we use the human will God gave us to continue to reject the truth of God's word concerning becoming a Christian and living close to God. So if you need to obey the gospel, now's the time to do it. One heartbeat away from eternity. If you die outside of Christ, pow, the moment you die, you know where you're going. The Bible's told you. So die faithful. 
Obey the gospel. Be added to the church. Live righteously. And as a Christian, when you see sin, repent of it. Confess it and pray God for forgiveness. And give all you've got to seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. There's a great day coming. A great day coming. The sinners shall be parted right and left. The question is, because I only have now, today's the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. The question is, am I ready for that day? If you're subject to the great invitation of our Lord, we invite you to come to Him while we stand and while we sing.